great to welcome you back as we are continuing our investigation of the history of the United States Constitution, the way it's been applied, its basic uh, construction, and certainly uh, the way that in some ways we've seen it, uh, maybe if I can use the word abused a little bit down through the uh, years since its inception, but uh, all in all it's been a a steady good piece of uh, solid philosophical foundation for our republic and we certainly appreciate that and uh, from the p point of view of us Christians we see in it the hand of God's providence as well as was readily and frequently acknowledged of course by our founding fathers who were responsible for crafting this great document. Uh, if you don't know it, I've mentioned it before, but this uh, short course that we're doing this summer uh, in an isolated situation here. I don't have a live audience, it's just you and me now, but uh, uh, this is a follow-up to a series that we did this past year entitled Presbyterians in the American Revolution. And if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that, you can uh, hunt it down and you may find it as a good background for the material that we're covering here. But our, our primary interest uh, in that series was to show how much the religious component played a role in the run-up to the American Revolution and in some ways this is just simply extending now the conversation a couple of decades into the future and noticing that again the very same people who had been responsible for a great deal of the thought that went into the revolutionary cause were also present there of course as they began to think about how to lay a foundation for a constitutional republic and that's exactly what took place. The uh, story, of course, involves many strands, many different threads of thought, and I'm, I, I'm simply highlighting one of them, but it is one that's uh, really conspicuously important and in some ways was a defining aspect of the entire thought at the time. We've mentioned that uh, something like two-thirds of the people that were in the colonies just before the American Revolution descended from uh, those who came out of the Reformed wing of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, there were Lutherans here as well, but not nearly as well represented as those that came from the Calvinistic side that uh, essentially landed in England and Scotland and uh, to some degree Ireland. And it was those in particular, of course, largely to flee uh, the pressures of religious persecution uh, in the continent and in Europe who were escaping here to a place where uh, it was commonly understood the idea of religious liberty and religious freedom was going to be practiced. They didn't quite have the robust idea that we finally find in the Constitution, but they were certainly pointed in that direction. And uh, the history of this period gives uh, ample evidence of that, and that's in part what we're trying to highlight here. Well, we've looked at the Constitution itself. We've looked at the basic structure of government that comes out of it, three branches, of course. Uh, we looked last time at the uh, uh, the legislative branch, the Congress, we looked at the uh, executive branch to some degree, the presidential, uh, and we're going to be focusing now, uh, shifting our focus really to the Bill of Rights. Uh, the Bill of Rights, of course, those first ten amendments to the Constitution, which uh, were really very important uh, at the time, they become part of the original document, and were viewed as uh, essential in order to make sure that this uh, Constitution was actually enacted. Uh, there were voices who essentially said that the Bill of Rights would be superfluous. Uh, famously, James Madison wasn't so sure we needed a, uh, a Bill of Rights. He felt that he had been sufficiently clear in delineating and limiting the powers of the federal government that uh, it was really not necessary to go into an extended discussion about all the other rights that were not going to be specifically mentioned that would be basically restrained uh, from government and given back to the people. Uh, that whole idea that government is uh, first of all based on inalienable rights in the people. Uh, that they are the ones that create the government and if they don't give the government a certain right then that right of course stays with the people. That was the notion. Jefferson said uh, we have inalienable rights that come from God and that the, uh, the purpose of government is not to give us those rights, but to secure those rights. A very different idea. The rights are already there from God. Government is there to make sure that those rights are not abused. And so that was the notion, and Madison felt like, well, enough said. You know, we don't need to plow into an extended discussion of this. But the anti-federalists who feared the growth of federal power uh, really did want to make sure that we spell these out somewhat clearly, and so that's exactly what happens. Uh, 
And so what we have in the Bill of Rights then is an expression of those rights which were viewed as being uh, part of the, uh, the uh, base, basic background of our republic and the rights that were secured to the people by government but actually had come originally from God himself. So that's, that's what we're going to be looking at. Before we get going, I'd like to pray. I, I had one person kind of criticize me for starting uh, these uh, sessions with prayer. Uh, maybe that person wasn't aware that this is an extension of a Sunday school class that I taught. And we always begin with prayer, and I feel like what we're doing now is still very much a part of that uh, particular exercise, and so I make no apology for wanting to invoke God's presence and guidance and wisdom as we seek to uh, be about this business. So just for a moment, would you join me in prayer as we get started? Our Father, we're grateful that you have given to us the opportunity of sharing together in these important matters. We pray that through the presence of your Spirit, you would give us clarity and insight and understanding that our thoughts would be reflective of the actual facts of the matter, and that in all of that, Christ would be honored, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, well, <clears throat> the Bill of Rights. Um, uh, as I say, some people weren't so sure that we even needed a Bill of Rights, but uh, eventually the Anti-Federalists uh, especially won the day and insisted, saying we really would not have a Constitution without them. Part of the reason that it was viewed as maybe unnecessary to have a Bill of Rights, because as you may know, uh, 11 of the 13 colonies already had their own separate Bills of Rights right up to the time of the uh, framing of the Constitution. These were influential documents that existed prior to 1791. Uh, and uh, in many ways, the rights that are protected in these Bills of Rights uh, really do reflect a great deal of what wound up in the a Bill of Rights of the Constitution. Six of the states, for example, uh, already prohibited an establishment of religion, although some of the other states actually had established religions. All 11 of the uh, uh, bills that existed at that point uh, allowed for a free exercise of religion. Uh, nine of the states protected expressly the freedom of press. Eight of the states protected and reserved to the people, quite clearly, the right to bear arms. Every state had provided for the right of a jury trial. Uh, when a person was accused of a, a serious criminal uh, kind of act, uh, uh, violation, uh, the right to a jury of the peers was viewed as highly important. That came out of the abuses that had uh, been commonplace in England, the so-called Star Chamber and other sorts of ju uh, judicial tribunals which of course took place in violation of fundamental ideas of uh, due process. Uh, one state uh, actually included in its Bill of Rights an express provision for freedom of speech. It might surprise you that the others didn't include that, but most of them thought that uh, freedom of speech was more or less obvious and implied by the rights that they had identified. Uh, there were notable protections for people abused of crimes. In England, of course, many people were accused of crimes, sometimes falsely, usually for political purposes. And, of course, a political accusation, uh, couched as a criminal accusation, can cause unbelievable abuse. And that is exactly what the framers were trying to avoid. So there was a fair amount of protection that was accorded to people who were criminally accused to make sure that there wasn't some kind of abuse that was taking place in that regard. It's always been a bit of an open question. What did the framers of the Constitution and what did those who drafted the Bill of Rights intend uh, in terms of the application of the Bill of Rights? Uh, obviously, on its original terms, it applied to the federal government, just as the original Constitution did. So right off the bat, the Bill of Rights says, Congress shall not make any law respecting an establishment of religion. You see, that was, a, that was an instruction and a limitation on Congress. And the question was, is that as far as the Bill of Rights goes? Does it apply to the states? The states had their own Bills of Rights. Was this viewed as something in addition to that, or supplementing or replacing the Bills of Rights of the states? It's really an open question, and there's not a, a great deal of uh, unanimity of opinion on historical and uh, constitutional scholars that have looked at this. John Marshall, of course an early important voice, limited the Bill of Rights to federal enactments against the states, indicating that fundamentally the Bill of Rights was a restraint on federal government to make sure it didn't intrude on the sovereign rights of the states. 
Uh, it was also understood generally that, as I said, the states had their own bills of rights and that maybe internal violations would be uh, disposed of according to those separate bills of rights that we find across the states that constituted the early uh, republic. Uh, some would say, on the other hand, that in fact it was intended that the Bill of Rights in the Constitution should apply to the states as well. It remained an open question. I would say uh, no one quite carried the day either way, but uh, all things in that connection changed rather dramatically when we get to the aftermath of the Civil War. You know that the three amendments to the Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, were all in some ways redressing and, appro and responding to uh, certain uh, events that took place in, of course, the aftermath of the uh, Civil War and the issues for which it was fought. And particularly the issue of slavery became a very important aspect of those. The 14th Amendment, probably of the three of them, is the one that is most important for our purposes at this point. And you'll notice the language of the 14th Amendment makes a rather dramatic change. So when we look at the 14th Amendment, we see it says, no state shall make or enforce any law, and so on. Notice that the operative word there is state. Uh, when we were looking at the original Bill of Rights, it said Congress shall not <clears throat> make any law respecting an establishment of religion. And all the way through, it's implied, at least, strongly suggested that the restraints that are being expressed are to be applied to the federal government. But now we have a reversal of that direction, and now the federal government is enacting a document uh, that applies to the states. Now again, it is we the people, of course, who stand behind the federal government in this sense, so it's not as if federal government is acting independently or unilaterally, but nevertheless, you'll notice the difference in the focus. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States. Uh, no state, secondly, shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And finally, uh, nor deny, meaning no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So we have in the 14th Amendment then three elements, privileges and immunities. We have due process, we have equal protection, and all of those are understood as rules by which the state is to exercise its authority. Now there's no question that at least on its face that particular part of what the 14th Amendment says is to be applied to the states. The question that sort of hung unanswered at the time of the 14th Amendment was, is there any sense in which the uh, 14th Amendment was at least impliedly intending to incorporate also the original federal Bill of Rights those first ten amendments and make them part of the package so that uh, the Bill of Rights would also be imposed upon the states or was it strictly privileges and immunities, due process, equal protection, was that all that was in mind? Uh, the uh, state level abuses of course were very important at the time because there was a newly released population of former slaves and in some cases in the southern states especially they were subjected to a fair amount of abuse and it was understood that uh, in order to alleviate that, it was necessary that some pretty heavy-handed measures be taken, rising to the level of amendments to the Constitution to prevent that sort of thing from happening. But it was a question, uh, was the original Bill of Rights packaged in the 14th Amendment, or was it strictly those ideas that have been ex uh, expressed here? The argument's gone both ways. Uh, one way or another, I think it's clear to say that at least at the beginning, uh, it was pretty much taken for granted that the Bill of Rights uh, in the f was not included as part of the 14th Amendment, that it was, while there was a debate, it was pretty much understood that that would not be the case. That was stated expressly in uh, 1872 in what were called the Slaughterhouse Cases, which expressly limited the 14th Amendment to uh, the matters expressly uh, ex explained there, that is, uh, privileges and immunities, due process, equal protection. Uh, those were the ideas that were especially uh, to be implied and the rest of the Bill of Rights were not understood to be included. But uh, you have an interesting thing happen in the early 1920s. Uh, it began with a case called Meyer versus Nebraska. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, while the details of the case are interesting, I'll bypass that for the moment, but just mention to you that uh, the upshot of the case uh, Myers versus Nebraska was to create a new class of due process violations. Now, I think you know due process has to do with what we might simply call a fair trial. It includes things that we more or less take for granted, a trial by jury, a right to conf uh, confront your accusers, to cross-examine them, uh, a right to have a, 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 an adjudication of your guilt or innocence in open court uh, so that people can simply walk in, as it were, off the street and see what's going on, that there's not some kind of private adjudicatory going on here that would deprive you of an opportunity to have a fair public hearing. All of that is considered part of due process. But in this case, uh, Meyer, uh, a little distinction was made between two kinds of due process. One was called procedural due process, and then distinguished from it was what was called substantive due process. Well, substantive due process was sort of a wholly new creation. Uh, and uh, it was distinguished from what had been traditional understandings of due process. Procedural due process is kind of a redundancy, you know. The word procedure and the word process are fundamentally the same root. A uh, process is a procedure. Uh, and so to say procedural due process was simply to say due process in the traditional sense of the term. But Meyer introduced a new category which was called substantive due process. Now, anyone that's been to law school knows that there's a difference between laws that are substantive and laws that are procedural. Substantive laws have to do with the content of the law, the particular uh, prohibition that may be in view. Don't steal, you know, or don't shoot somebody, that kind of thing. Whereas process has to do with how you are treated once you have been accused of a substantive violation. So you see you've got substance in the law and then the procedure to which you are entitled once the uh, allegation of a substantive violation has occurred. To speak of substantive due process, therefore, is a little bit of an oxymoron. You know, it's like talking about a flat basketball or something. It doesn't make sense. Uh, there's, uh, there's something about it that uh, really does represent a rather striking invention by the court at that time, but it has continued to be a standard distinction to this day. And it's on that basis that we begin to see a certain amount of the Bill of Rights incorporated through the Due Process Clause, but through the substantive side, as it were, of the Due Process Clause into application to the states. And uh, that's really kind of a turning point then. Uh, there were several cases at the time, Society of Sisters uh, used substantive due process to protect parents' educational rights but probably more importantly was another case called Gitlow. Uh, Gitlow was an anarchist. He liked to preach his uh, anarchist message, and he liked to do it using the free speech rights that we have in the United States, so he'd get up on his proverbial soapbox in the public park and preach anarchy. Well, an ordinance was passed that would uh, prevent him from doing such a thing, uh, and uh, as a result of that, he sued and challenged, and that case bounced its way all the, uh, all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And at that time, the court made a very interesting uh, statement in connection with the conclusion that it reached, which, by the way, protected uh, Gitlow's uh, right to uh, preach a message of anarchy. Uh, but the statement was as follows, quote, For present purposes, we may and do assume that freedom of speech and of the press, which are protected by the First Amendment from abridgment by Congress, are among the fundamental personal rights and, quote, liberties protected by, notice it, the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment from impairment by the states. Very interesting, isn't it? Uh, you don't have to be a lawyer to, to recognize there's something that is a little bit odd about that statement that uh, free speech, freedom of press, are protected by due process. Due process had always meant the process to which you were entitled once you had been accused of a crime, but now we're actually speaking of the crime itself as being governed by due process. And that became a new way of thinking about the Bill of Rights and how it applied to the states. Since that time, the Supreme Court has held that some but not all of the 
terms of the Bill of Rights are imposed upon the states. This is called the doctrine of incorporationism. I remember learning about that in my second year of law school in a criminal procedure class. The doctrine of incorporationism, meaning that certain of the provisions of the Bill of Rights would be incorporated through the Due Process Clause to apply to the states, and thus the states were going to be held at points, not all points now, but at some points determined by the Supreme Court to the same standard that was part of the original Bill of Rights of the Federal Constitution. It's a rather interesting development, uh, a little bit of an anomaly. Uh, maybe it's been abused occasionally, we'll talk a little bit about that. But one way or another it's clear enough that it does represent a little bit of a departure from what uh, would have been taken for granted by the founders, and so we'll just keep an eye on that as we go along. Well, with that, let's uh, go ahead and take a look at the First Amendment. I just want to cover the first two provisions uh, of the First Amendment, both of which have to do with religion. And I might just mention at the outset how important it is to notice that religion is the first item of discussion in the Bill of Rights. This was incredibly important to the Founding Fathers. They, of course, had memories uh, that went back only a generation or two to the abuses to which they or their forebears had been uh, subjected in England and Scotland and Ireland, and it was precisely for that reason that they had come here. Uh, that was very much part of the motivating force that brought them across the ocean to uh, settle here. And of course here there was generally an understanding through the charters that were enacted that religious freedom was going to be exercised. Now it didn't mean universal freedom anywhere, but it meant that uh, various states, various colonies would be free to establish their own religious standards and that there weren't going to be some sort of impositions that would come from afar. Well, how important was it that there be this kind of religious freedom in the colonies? It was so important that when the framers got together to articulate a Bill of Rights, the first thing on the agenda, the first thing they mentioned, were two separate provisions, all of which, or both of which, applied to the question of the, uh, of the uh, practice of religion in the colonies. <clears throat> I might mention this was unprecedented in history. Up until uh, the framing of the United States Constitution, there had never been in human history a state which had organized itself in part around the principle of religious freedom. In fact, just the opposite was absolutely taken for granted across Western history and certainly around the rest of the world that there was going to be an official religion and that the idea of religious freedom was sort of an almost unthinkable uh, and absurd idea, you would say, traditionally speaking. But now here comes a nation uh, that is uh, beginning on the very premise that religious freedom is going to be the order of the day. <clears throat> Interestingly, even among the colonies, many of them, in fact, well, I won't say most, but many of them, uh, had violated this very principle of an established religion. Virginia had an established religion, for example. Georgia had an established religion, and others had these official religious uh, uh, bodies that existed within those with state sanction. And so by the time we get to the Constitution, we're already seeing a departure even what, from what had been a fairly common practice among the colonies. Why was that? Why the change of view? Again, as we detailed in our former course on Presbyterians and the American Revolution, uh, it's important to note how important, how powerfully the colonies had been affected by religious movements here, uh, especially beginning with George Whitfield and the Great Awakening and those that came after him, a variety of religious movements, the New Light Presbyterians as they were called, similar movements in the congregational churches, the Baptists, and others who arose were not part of any established church and in fact in some cases were heartily persecuted, or at least there were attempts to do so in the colonies, for some of these sort of upstart new religious movements that took place as part, as part of the uh, Great Awakening. And yet, uh, it was also notable to the framers that some of these New Light Presbyterians, Baptists, and others had been some of the most important voices supporting the revolutionary cause. And it did cause them to think to themselves, you know, if these people were that important in fighting for the revolutionary spirit of this country, maybe we should rethink our whole policy about uh, established religions. 
And as a result of that, you might say, by the time we reach the Constitution, there was a rather different attitude about the whole thing. And the notion of an established religion had really fallen on somewhat uh, dark times. It's worth asking the question as we plow into this a bit, just what is an established religion? Uh, many people today think they know what it means, but of course, uh, if you were to go back and uh, ask one of the framers of the Constitution, or even if you just went out and asked a man on the street, you know, what do you understand to be the meaning of the term an established religion? You might get an answer that would at least in some point surprise you a bit. Uh, obviously, an established religion is a religion that has been declared by law to be the official religion or church of the realm. That is, the state has to say this particular branch of the religious life of humanity is going to be officially recognized as the religion for this particular domain. That was taken for granted in Europe. In fact, it was virtually impossible to imagine going to a place where there wasn't an established religion. And uh, part of the persecution that took place in Europe after the Protestant Reformation was born right out of that very conviction. And even in the Reformed uh, lands where the Reformation was embraced, it was still taken for granted that there would be an established religion. You see, that was just uh, part of the course, and nobody was really thinking too much about true, full religious uh, freedom that really hadn't quite occurred to people yet. So this is what was meant by an established religion. Uh, uh, incident to that, everyone is required to publicly confess on an oath their support of the established religion. Now I might say in the Protestant countries uh, there was an innovation called the right to immigrate which was uh, brought into the picture to say if you don't agree we're going to uh, not take you out and burn you at the stake, but we're going to instead give you the freedom to leave. And many people did. They would uh, vote with their feet and go to a place where the religious outlook was more compatible. But again, it wasn't really understood, even in, in uh, Protestant countries in Europe, uh, until much later that the notion of religious freedom should be understood as, ta uh, as the order of the day. Uh, heresy with the established church disagreeing with it was regarded as a criminal offense. It's a crime, in other words, to disagree openly with the teaching of the established church. That crime was a serious crime, so much so that it could be punished by death. And thus we have many cases, of course, in European history of people being burned at the stake or otherwise abused or mistreated or executed as a result of differing on religious matters. Mary Tudor in England burned some 300 people at the stake during her fairly brief uh, years reigning as Mary Tudor, or Bloody Mary she's sometimes called there in England. An official church, an established church, has the right of imprimatur with respect to any publication. Even the Bible required the uh, approval, the stamp, you might say, of approval of the church. It was required that everybody pay taxes to the official church of the realm. Whether you agreed with them or not, taxes were due. Other churches could, in some cases, be tolerated. This was not always the case, but sometimes an official church might make an allowance for another non-conforming church, as it was called, but it was only with the permission of the established church. And a tolerated church would generally not be able to call itself a church. It would have to call itself a chapel or a meeting house or something like that. Very importantly, uh, an established church had the right of performing marriage exclusively. Uh, if you were in the course that we did on the American Revolution, you may recall Mecklenburg County and the heartburn they went through over what was called the Marriage and Vestry Act, which basically restricted Mecklenburg County, which was almost 100% Presbyterian, uh, by a rule that said only Anglicans could perform a legitimate uh, marriage, and that the rights and privileges appertaining to marriage would only flow to a couple that had been married under the sanction of the Anglican Church. Well, you can imagine a lot of Presbyterians there in Mecklenburg County were not too pleased about that. That was one of the triggering events that really led to the rising revolutionary spirit. That was uh, part of the story that we covered at that time. Uh, traditionally, the established church could arrest a person and try that person 
for violations of the law respecting the church, including heresy. If they were found guilty, then that person would be handed over for punishment to the state. The state didn't necessarily try the person, but had to accept the verdict that was rendered by the church. But if the church concluded that the crime was serious enough to warrant uh, execution, then that's the punishment that would be carried out. We might say that that represents a rather intimate marriage of the uh, relationship between the church and the state. And uh, that was part of what concerned the framers as they were considering this whole matter. Uh, this is what really, in many ways, the founders were trying to eliminate when they put the Establishment Clause in place. They didn't want uh, uh, civil uh, punishments to be meted out at the, uh, at the dictates of the church uh, based on the fact that the church had found somebody guilty of a certain crime that had been committed. And so that was the basic notion, and if you went back and asked somebody at the time what's an established religion, you'd get some answer that really fell within those confines, at least to some degree. Uh, really, if we were going to say how should the Constitution be construed, and especially how shall the first provision of the First Amendment, having to do with establishment of religion, be construed, it should be construed according to those standards. Those were the accepted ideas associated with an established religion at the time, and, and rationality would suggest that that's the definition that should, we should have in mind. And it's fair to say that at least at times in constitutional history, that's precisely the evaluation that has been brought to bear. There was a case in 1983 called uh, Marsh versus Chambers, uh, in which um, the, uh, uh, one of the senators, a man named Chambers, was challenging the practice of the Nebraska Senate to open its sessions with prayer. They would invite in a, a pastor, uh, and the pastor would offer a prayer, an invocation of God's blessing on the senatorial business that was about to take place. Chambers uh, was presumably an atheist. He didn't uh, believe that that was an appropriate thing for the Senate to be doing, and he challenged it on the basis of the Establishment Clause. And he said, Here, here's the Establishment Clause being used uh, or abuse, I should say, uh, in, uh, in this practice which has the effect of advancing a religion. If you read the case of Marsh versus Chambers, uh, you'll be impressed with the fact that the Supreme Court did exactly what it ought to do. It went back and asked the question, what is an established religion? And you'll find the answer it came up with uh, really was something like what I just described to you as an established religion. And they said, you know, Having somebody pray at the beginning of a senatorial session is certainly no violation of the Establishment Clause if it's understood in its original sense. If that's what the Supreme Court always did on the topic, then I doubt that we'd be talking much about it here because it would be a pretty simple analysis and there would be very little room for abuse. But unfortunately, the Supreme Court hasn't always been quite so consistent. There was another case entitled Lemon versus Kurtzman, actually 10 years before Marsh, which reached a very different analysis and reached a different kind of uh, conclusion. Uh, this was a case involving parents who were seeking reimbursement for instructional expenses, and uh, that was viewed as a violation of the Establishment Clause. These are parents of parochial students, so their students were in a church-sponsored school, but they were seeking state reimbursement for the expenses of, uh, of instruction. Uh, the Lemon Test, as it's called, came up with three points which would test whether or not a particular practice or policy or statute violated the uh, Establishment Clause. Uh, the first test, uh, did the policy have a religious purpose uh, as opposed to a secular purpose? So we look at the statute and see whether its motivating uh, interest was religious in character. Uh, was the statute or policy uh, calculated with the primary effect that it would advance or inhibit religion generally. Notice now in both cases, religion doesn't mean a particular religion, it doesn't mean a particular branch of the Christian movement or any other religion for that matter, but it simply is speaking generically of religion uh, broadly speaking with no particular organizational expression in mind. And finally, does this statute or policy involve excessive entanglement uh, with religion? Well, the court looked at uh, the facts of the case, but it used that analysis, and that analysis continued to be an extremely important analysis, and to this day, the Lemon Test is uh, commonly used. 
The only thing I want you to notice about it is how far that deviates, really, from the notion of an established religion. This is no longer established religion in the original sense at all. It's simply a kind of a broad way of speaking about religious, uh, religious expression in any form whatsoever. Religious conviction is swept within the ambit here. So in many ways, uh, the lemon test goes way beyond what the framers would have anticipated. Uh, but it has become more or less common in more recent years to use the lemon test and to find against various public policies that might otherwise be viewed as having some sort of uh, salutary effect with respect to public religious expression. At the time, the Chief Justice, uh, Justice Berger, uh, writing this opinion, noted that those standards were what he called at best only a dim demarcation. And he made reference to a famous phrase that you've probably heard, that in America we have a wall of separation between church and state. That's pretty misleading, you know. There was no intention that there be a wall of separation between church and state, but that term was used by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, uh, was asked by the Danbury Baptists, as they were called, why he had not called for a national day of prayer. After all, George Washington had called for national days of prayer. Uh, John Adams, the second president, had called for national days of prayer and fasting. Uh, both of these men were quite conspicuous in their religious outlook and quite outspoken in affirming their religious views. And then Thomas Jefferson came along, who was uh, you know, considerably less religious, you might say, at least in the conventional sense of the term, than either of his forebears had been, and he neglected to call for a national day of prayer, and the Danbury Baptists wondered about that and wondered what uh, was the reason that uh, Jefferson had failed to do so. And he gave this very famous response out of which the phrase wall of separation originated, in which he says, quote, believing with you that religion is a matter that lies solely between a man and his God, and that he owes account to no other for his faith or worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only, not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should, quote, make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or pro prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. And, of course, that wall of separation has really taken on a life of its own, as if it were constitutional. The Constitution prohibited established religions pretty much in the form that I was describing earlier. But uh, to make it a, a wall that separates uh, public life, political life, from religious life uh, entirely goes uh, way, way beyond anything the framers would have envisioned. In fact, I think they probably would have dreaded that there would be such a development in our ensuing history. Even um, uh, Jefferson himself uh, wasn't nearly as, uh, as uh, ferocious in these views as you might get the impression, uh, but uh, he even allowed that the, for example, Department of the Treasury, the facility there, Department of the Treasury, could be used for religious services. He had no objection to that. Uh, that idea that you could have religious expression taking place in the halls of the, uh, of the uh, federal government was no violation in his point of view whatsoever. But you'd have to say that this lemon test has been applied in a rather sweeping way. One of the more dramatic examples of that took place only a couple of years after uh, the Marsh case. This is 1985, in which uh, there was a, uh, a, a test of a policy that had been enacted in a public school in which it was uh, simply going to be the practice that at the beginning of each school day there would be a voluntary moment of silence. And uh, in this voluntary moment of silence, students would be given the opportunity, though no requirement, uh, but the opportunity to pray if they wished to, or they could just move, use it as a moment of uh, uh, sort of silence, you know, a meditation, whatever, but there was no religious character to it. and. Um, in that particular practice, a moment of silence was challenged uh, and it came to the Supreme Court and once again the court applied the lemon test and found that even that, as innocuous as it might seem on its face, nevertheless represented a violation 
of the uh, Establishment Clause and was thus found to be inappropriate. Uh, so we have come a long way from what was originally envisioned by the Establishment Clause and, and uh, whether that's good or bad I'll leave to your own judgment but it does certainly represent a radical departure I would say from the original sense of that phrase. At the same time, the Establishment Clause does not do what many people seem to think it does. There are popular misconceptions with respect to the Establishment Clause. Uh, to this day, religious groups can use a government facility as long as the same facility is open on a neutral basis to other groups that may use it for other purposes. Uh, religious schools are free to participate in education choice programs like vouchers and so on. There's no violation of the Establishment Clause that's been found in that connection. A law may be passed based on a religious belief. In other words, a politician goes to Washington, D.C., is uh, involved in passing a law which is in fact compatible with that politician's own religious outlook. As long as the law can be justified at the same time on independent bases, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. People who have challenged that have been uh, unable to make that case stick. Certainly no prohibition to a religious person holding a political office. I've heard that argument made that the Establishment Clause should prohibit anyone who is a, a Presbyterian or a Baptist or a Methodist you know, from running for political office because it involves uh, breaking down that wall of separation. Well, that's not only not true, it's absurd and certainly uh, no part of what the Establishment Clause uh, represents. <clears throat> well, that's the Establishment Clause. That it gives you a feel for how it's been uh, used, how it's been stretched, I would say, uh, a little bit more than probably was envisioned, but that's where things are right at the moment. The other religion clause is called the free exercise of religion. I'm calling this uh, lecture, by the way, you may have noticed, of Catholics and Mormons. Uh, because uh, I remember in law school, my law school professor, when he was dealing with the Establishment Clause, called it the clause that dealt with what he called the Catholic problem. The Catholic problem. He was a Catholic, by the way, kind of a nominal Catholic. But uh, that's what he viewed as the issue that was being established or being addressed by the Establishment Clause. Obviously, traditionally in Europe, the Catholic Church, uh, in those nations that accepted it, was the established church. And there, in the Catholic vision, there's really no safe distinction, you might say, between church and state. They are fused and merged into one great institution. And thus, the idea that there would be some sort of working separation between them would be somewhat foreign in that Catholic tradition. Even Henry VIII in England, before the, uh, the English Reformation, uh, his chief uh, counselor, political counselor, was a cardinal of the Catholic Church, wore his red robes all the time. Nobody you know, raised an issue of church and state. That was just taken for granted that a high churchman would be an immediate advisor to the king. Uh, that was the Catholic view. And of course, the framers wanted to avoid that. They didn't want to have an established religion in that sense. And so my law school prof was simply saying, in some ways, the Establishment Clause was there to address what he called the Catholic problem. When it came to free exercise, he said, this is addressing the Mormon problem. So we have uh, one religion that sort of uh, was uh, pressured by one of these and another religion that was pressured by the other. You may know the history, of course, when Utah was seeking statehood. Uh, the whole issue of polygamy came up and, and it actually got to the point where a congressional act was going to uh, result in the S-cheat, <clears throat> that is the forfeiture of all Mormon properties in Utah based on the widespread practice of polygamy. Uh, that particular law was challenged to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court agreed that uh, polygamy was uh, too far that in spite of our free exercise religion, there's a limit to the extent to which you can freely exercise your religion. And that point is when the practice itself is viewed as somehow uh, destructive uh, to the order of the state, you see, to an ordered society. And at that point, at least, polygamy uh, fell within that, within that bound. And so the importance of marriage, the importance of the institution, the stability, of the sanctity, really, of marriage at the time carried the day. Uh, fortunately for the, for the uh, Mormon church, there was a revelation that came right about that time that instructed Mormons no longer to practice polygamy, and so statehood was achieved, and uh, the rest is history, as they say. But uh, at the time, it was quite a neat incident, and that's why my law school prof uh, referred to the free exercise of religion as addressing the uh, Mormon problem.
Uh, but I'd like to look at it with a little bit of a different slant to it. And by the way, we're not going to get through this one. I'm just going to introduce free exercise here briefly and we'll come back and pick up next time with a little bit more of a detailed analysis of the way it's been applied. But the language of the free exercise clause is simply nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So we have two clauses. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Uh, for some years I taught uh, constitution to high schoolers, to high school juniors and seniors. And uh, as we came to this particular clause, by the way, every year we read the entire constitution word for word, uh, comment on every line of it, uh, comment on all of the uh, Bill of Rights and so on. That was just part of the uh, curricula of that particular course. But whenever we came to this particular uh, part of the Constitution, the two clauses, I said these two function a little bit like two bookends. You know, if you have a bookshelf and you have bookends on each side of the shelf holding up the books, then you understand that what is in the center is being stabilized by those two bookends. And I said in some ways religious freedom in the United States is guarded by two bookends. Uh, and they stand for a sort of opposite ends of the problem of religious freedom. On the one hand, you have the Establishment Clause, which I said is really there to prevent government from helping any religion too much. The Free Exercise Clause is there to prevent government from hurting any religion too much. So one is aimed at, no, at uh, preventing too much help, the other at preventing too much hurt. Uh, and in the middle, between those two, the expanse that lies there is where we practice our religious freedom in this country. Both of them have limits, but of course it's uh, on the right side of those limits that religious freedom is practiced. Uh, it's a very interesting thing. If you look at the history of, of uh, treatment of the Establishment Clause, you'll find that quite predictably there's a political element to the way in which the Establishment Clause is viewed. So if a person is uh, politically leans to the left, the further they lean to the left, the more expansive they want to make the Establishment Clause, ultimately to the point that religion is essentially frozen out entirely of public conversation. It no longer has a role to play in the public square. Uh, that's part of the leftist uh, sort of inclination to make the state God, and thus there's no place uh, in a truly leftist economy for some sort of uh, place for God as an independent and indeed transcendent authority. Uh, that's very predictable if you look at the cases that treat uh, this. On the other hand, those who are more politically conservative tend to want to give a more restricted application to the Establishment Clause. They want to see it simply as restricting established religion in the more traditional sense of the term, but not to push it way beyond its uh, bounds. Uh, that's almost, uh, almost always the case, and certainly a review of the cases in connection with the Establishment Clause makes that uh, fairly clear. The reason I mention this is because when we come to the uh, Free Exercise Clause, uh, that's not the case at all. Uh, and in fact, what you'd find is in many cases, uh, those who are both politically uh, liberal and those who are politically conservative wind up very much sharing the very same view when it comes to how the uh, Free Exercise Clause should be applied. Uh, the Free Exercise Clause has to do with personal religious actions, rights, and basically it's subjected to two tests, and these are tests that can apply elsewhere, but uh, especially they've been used as important in connection with, uh, with Establishment Clause violations, or at least allegations concerning that. The first of these tests is the provision the statute, the regulation, and so on, uh, whatever it might be, is the provision unconstitutional on its face. That is to say, no matter how you apply it, you're going to get a constitutional violation. You know, if uh, a city were to uh, go looking for someone to be the new chief of police, and uh, part of their uh, policy for hiring for this position provided that anybody can apply to this position as long as they're not a Presbyterian. You know, if that were the, if that were the rule that was applied, then you would say on its face that's not constitutional because that's punishing one particular free exercise of religion as opposed to the others, and that certainly would represent a violation, a constitutional infraction on its face. The second one is a little more subtle is the uh, provision unconstitutional, quote, as applied. Uh, 
That is, it may on its face be neutral, it may be fine, there may be no evident constitutional violation, but in practice you find that it does have an effect of, uh, of violating the free exercise rights of a particular religious movement. Or it may otherwise, as applied, have the effect of restricting uh, one particular kind of uh, person under the effects of that particular rule. Uh, just for example, you could imagine maybe a, a state passes a law that says that, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, corporations in this state uh, may not openly endorse a uh, candidate for a public office. All right, so you've got, you've got incorporated businesses throughout the state. Uh, the people in those businesses can obviously vote for whomever they want. But the prohibition is saying that uh, these, the businesses themselves are not permitted to publicly endorse to, you know, buy funds in support of a particular candidate. That might, I can imagine various reasons that there might be a, a law to that effect. I don't know if there is a law like that anywhere, but there could be. Well, uh, that might be fine, but then when you find out as the law is being applied that uh, newspapers are corporations within in the state, and of course newspapers, by the nature of the case, will often endorse a candidate. That's what op-eds are for. That's what opinion pieces are all about. That's what the uh, editorial page is supposed to do, you know, is give opinions concerning political candidacies. And thus you would say that while the law was generally neutral, as applied, especially to newspapers, it was unconstitutional. I think you see the difference. So when we come to free exercise questions, that's basically the way in which the analysis is undertaken. Uh, one case, just to uh, kind of illustrate the point, is uh, a 1940 case. It was Cantwell versus Connecticut. Uh, there was a Jehovah's Witness named Mr. Cantwell, and he was going out and quite aggressively distributing Jehovah's Witness literature door-to-door -door in a neighborhood that was preponderantly Catholic. Well, the uh, Catholics uh, got together and got their city council to enact an ordinance that basically prevented uh, this Jehovah's Witness from doing his job, and he sued, and that case all the, uh, made it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and in that particular case, uh, the court, of course, sided with Cantwell for obvious reasons, saying that uh, this, this basically gets the state involved in the business of saying one person's religion is acceptable and another person's religion is not. And on its face, of course, that was viewed as unconstitutional, and uh, thus the ruling was in favor of Cantwell. That's been an important case in uh, free exercise uh, thought down through history since that time, and it's been cited uh, multiple times in that connection. It's worth noting, by the way, in passing here, that in the United States, uh, there's a distinction between freedom to believe as opposed to freedom to act. Uh, we've taken the view that freedom to believe is absolute, but freedom to act is not. You can believe anything you want, you see, but as soon as you act on some belief in a way that is viewed as threatening to an ordered society, that's where you may run into trouble. I've actually gotten serious emails from people who've accused me of uh, teaching false doctrine because I teach, uh, I don't teach it, I'm not a scientist, but I've at least assumed in my teaching that the Earth is a planet, you know, and that it revolves around the sun. And I've had people write to me emails more than once and saying, I'm teaching false doctrine because the Bible teaches the Earth is flat. And, uh, you know, that the sun is up there and hell is down beneath us and that uh, we are all the victims of a grand conspiracy to believe that the Earth is a globe and circles the sun, any of those kinds of things. Well, you know, like I say, a person can believe what they want, and uh, that's fine, but if a person were to take a view like that and go out and begin trying to act in a way that uh, had a negative impact on the public square, on education, and so on, that might be where they would get into a bit of uh, trouble. We allow people to believe what they want, but we don't let those beliefs translate into unbridled action. Uh, so the ability to regulate religion aligns with the ability to keep an ordered society and to prevent actions that might disrupt that order. This obviously can be a somewhat uh, you know, sl sliding scale, you might say, a little bit of a soft standard, but nevertheless the idea is there. It's essentially the same standard that would apply to regulating free speech. Uh, you know, you can't cry fire in a crowded theater, that sort of thing. We have free speech, but we have limits on it. Uh, free press, that sort of thing.
One thing that's clear under the free exercise clause, government must never regulate religious actions just because they are religious. That is not sufficient reason. Uh, the laws that are enacted that may have a negative impact on religious practice must be applicable uh, in a neutral way so that any such action, religious or not, would be found to violate the standard that is in view. Sometimes we try to go back and find out where do the founding fathers uh, come out on this one. It's not hard to figure it out on the Establishment Clause. This one's a little bit uh, more difficult. Uh, it's not altogether clear. Madison certainly was one who uh, was very uh, conservative at this point, you might say. He was one of the most important voices in support of religious uh, freedom and the free exercise of religion. Uh, but others uh, were not so clear on that and it remained a bit of a, uh, a question you know, where they might be. But I think at least in history we've tried to uh, develop a standard here that would be reasonable. Uh, the standard that is currently the, the test that is generally applied is called the Sherbert test. It's a four-part test in which a statute or policy is going to be tested as to whether or not it violates uh, the free exercise of religion. Uh, the first two prongs of this test generally are never where the problem arises. The first question was the person pursuing a sincere religious belief. Well, virtually always, uh, you know, the person is going to win on that one. Uh, it's hard to uh, imagine how they would get into a person's psyche to the level to establish that they weren't acting according to a sincere religious belief. Similarly, with the second one, did the law impose a substantial burden on the free exercise of religion? Well, again, a person can say that a particular restriction was a burden to their free exercise. We can imagine that. And once again, it would be difficult for the state to prove uh, anything to the contrary. The point where it becomes a little bit more dicey and where the real test usually occurs is with the third and fourth of these. The third one, does the law fulfill a compelling government interest? All right. Well, you can imagine a compelling government interest. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a governmental interest to prevent discrimination against women. Okay, so that's a pretty common area where the government might say it has a very compelling interest to make sure that women are not discriminated against in various uh, settings of the uh, marketplace. Well, let's say you have a church and a church has a policy of not hiring women to be pastors. And uh, so you might have a woman who's been declined a job based on the fact that she's a woman who sues and now the, the, the state is faced, the court is faced with making a judgment between two competing interests. The interest of the state in connection with uh, non-discrimination, the interest of the church in connection with restricting uh, leadership in the church to those who are uh, viewed as being qualified. What's the court going to do with that? Well, there's been mixed results, of course, on that. Generally, at least at this point, the church has been granted their free exercise uh, rights along those lines, but you can imagine that that would be a bit more of a, a challenge along these lines. The fourth one similarly raises a, uh, a question, could this interest be accomplished by a less restrictive means? Uh, there was a case coming out of uh, Pennsylvania, I believe it was, where the Amish were being uh, criminally charged because they were violating a rule that said that vehicles that operate on public highways must have lights on them, especially tail lights, you know. And the Amish objected to that because of that uh, innovation of a tail light. Uh, was representing a kind of technological advance that they weren't prepared to embrace. But in this case, there was possible to reach a compromise. And so the uh, buggies that were used by the Amish had plastered on the back of them those red uh, triangles, you know, that glow, and, and uh, that was viewed as a way of uh, avoiding that. And sometimes uh, a solution like that becomes possible, other times not so much. But at least gives you an idea of how uh, that particular test has been applied, and it, it continues to be the uh, standard, more or less, uh, when we have these free exercise cases that come along. As I say, there's more to say uh, on the uh, free exercise of religion. We're going to be returning to that and going into some greater detail on that point. Uh, fascinating history, really, that we've had on it, but this at least gives you the lay of the land, and we'll return to those themes next time we're around. So thanks for joining us. Always nice to have you along. Hope this is uh, useful information to you. As I say, uh, all things being equal, about a week from now we're going to upload our next installment in this series. So I hope that you'll be able to uh, join us then. Until then, uh, thank you for being here.